Wake up! It's time for the Spring 2021 San Diego City College Vamp Storytelling Showcase, Wake Up! Recorded at a super secret, undisclosed location in San Diego's Eastern Counties. And now, your hosts, Professors Trissy McGee and Ella DeCastro. Welcome to Vamp! Vamp is a student storytelling showcase produced in partnership between City College's City Voices Literary Series and So Say We All, a nonprofit community literary arts organization. We want to thank City College, City College's Social Justice and Education Conference for making tonight's event possible. The performers you are about to listen to were chosen out of over 50 submissions. Each performer worked on their drafts over a period of five weeks, attending workshops and working with writing coaches and performing coaches. If you like what you hear, we want to see you get on stage and read your story. Please go to SoSayWeAllOnline.com to find out more. Tonight's show contains adult themes and language. San Diego City College campus mental health is free to City College students. You can find more information on the college website. And now, June Cressy will start with a dedication to Nancy Carey, a City College professor and former So Say We All board president and a dear friend of ours who we miss. Okay. Hi, my name is June Cressy and I, have, I was Nancy Carey's friend for more than 25 years and we worked at City College together and I'm going to read a short piece of her work and then some memories of us. This is the beginning of a memoir chapter Nancy called Student as a Political Act. I cut classes in October, not even a month into my first quarter. Two friends that I'd made in beginning German, Jim and Dwight, planned to meet me at MacArthur Court for the Vietnam moratorium. I was excited because it was the first time that I could be part of a big war protest. Anything could happen. I wanted to do the sanctioned march from campus to downtown City Hall, where there'd be a five-minute silent vigil. Rumors also hinted that the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, would hold an independent march to the campus ROTC building. I'd read in the school newspaper, the Oregon Daily Emerald, that moratorium planners had covered how to be prepared as a marcher if the city responded by tear gassing or arresting protesters if things got out of control. I didn't feel prepared to handle getting arrested. I was afraid to get hurt, but also with my dad paying my tuition, I felt guilty about cutting classes and definitely wouldn't drop a class. The 15th of October started out as a rainy Wednesday morning. I wore a plaid poncho under a green umbrella with the university's Donald Duck mascot, something I'd bought as a joke because everyone told me the Oregon rains were coming. At breakfast, my dorm friends said they'd be going to early classes, but planned to meet up later at the march. I wanted to be at the opening talks, not miss a thing. I felt that what I was doing was going to be important, now that I was 18, old enough to vote and make a difference. Nancy and I mirrored each other on opposite coasts during that 1969 moratorium. Me in D.C. and she in Oregon. We felt we were doing something critical and making a difference. Peace was important to both of us all our lives. She stayed the quiet peacemaker while I have remained the protester. Each matters. Education and writing was also always a priority for both of us. And we met up at City College in the late 80s, she as faculty <coughs> and me as staff. She was a founder of the City Works Literary Anthology and for years we worked together as authors and editors. I joined the campus writing group she was in. Later we formed a new group with Ella and Trissy and another. Nancy, the true foodie, wanted to edit a food anthology, Hunger and Thirst, and we were her co-editors. It took work, it was real, we learned a lot, and we were proud of it. Over the years, we shared first drafts, meals, readings, 
family ups and downs, her cancer, my drinking and sobriety, births and deaths, campus BS, and bird watching walks along the Famosa Slough and the San Diego River out of Dog Beach. One of our most rewarding experiences was driving to Yosemite in a gloriously green spring to a weekend meditation and writing retreat with Natalie Goldberg. The blazing lodge fireplace, the thundering waterfall, the fragrant meadow grasses underfoot awakened dormant stories in us. Nancy was many things to many people, and that 18-year-old moratorium demonstrator did do important things and make a difference throughout her life. She was my friend for more than 25 years. Most of the important things I did, the, the most important thing I did, was to pull into the Costco loading dock in Mission Valley and call her the night before her surgery. We talked about both of us being published in a Year in Ink anthology. We laughed a lot about her having to drink a gallon of water that night. We talked about my coming to visit. And the last thing we said to each other was, I love you. She is at peace now, and I am still protesting the loss of my friend. But she is present at the City College Vamp, listening to a new generation of college writers find their voices and make a difference. Nancy would be proud of you. Thank you to June Cressy, who helped us to remember our friend Nancy Carey. And here are tonight's performers in no particular order. Devin Watson. Katie Samantha, Ruby Rodriguez, Elena Alcaraz, Tadashi Hiora, Jimmy Willie, and Nathan Leathers. Wow, I'm really high right now. About 20,000 feet in an airplane chock full of people from all corners of the world. It's crazy. The clouds brush past the window and I can finally see it. A mosaic of buildings painting the capital of Japan, Tokyo. A serious game of rock, paper, scissors got me stuck in the middle seat. To my left is my older sister, Kayla, with her olive skin and baby cheeks scribbling away in her sketchbook. She's 22 and I'm 18, but everyone thinks I'm the older one, probably because she worries a lot less. To my right is my best friend, Sebastian, he just turned 18, but already has more tattoos than most people. One time he asked me if I wanted a tattoo from his friend who was still learning, but I had to pass. <laughs> I'm so thankful they were here with me. There's no way in hell I would be here on this plane by myself. Not even two months ago, Sebastian and I played our last punk show at the space bar. We left the familiar, war familiar winter rains of San Diego behind and greeted the tropical warmth of Thailand. Thankfully, the American dollar goes really far in Thailand. You can basically pitch a tent anywhere you want, as long as you're smart about it. So living about ten on $10 a day was possible. But now, it's different. Everyone warns me that Japan is more expensive than America, and the 2K I saved for this trip is quickly running low. Why didn't I save more? Or rather, why did I ball out in Thailand when I still have another eight weeks to spend here? <laughs> We're walking off the plane, and Sebastian says, my friend mommy said we can stay with her for a few days. Hell yeah! I've been sleeping in a two-person tent with three people for a month and a half, and I'm so tired of smelling their B.O. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how much we can take the basic comforts of modern life for granted, like a roof and daily shower. But being fresh out of high school, this is exactly what I was looking for, to be uncomfortable. Even if it means barely scribbling enough money to get by, I just need to see this world in a, some way that isn't the abundance of America. Fresh out of the airport, we're hit with the sight of bustling people and towering billboards. The smell of food hovering in the air kisses my nose. Japanese youth in amazingly intricate and colorful custom-made outfits glide through the streets. Cute, cuddly company mascots coaxing you to come into their coolest, futuristic building designs I've ever seen. I don't even know where to meet, I don't even know where to rest my eyes. It's all too much. This city just seems so alive, like it's begging to be explored. But after a six hour flight from Bangkok, all I can think about right now is food. Without having to say a word, Kayla and Seb have the same idea. 
because they start dragging me to the 7-Eleven on the corner of the street. The sliding doors open with a rush, and the warm fluorescent lights illuminate the aisles. Is this heaven? Maybe for someone who has the fat stacks, but that's not me. In fact, that's not any of us right now. I'm pretty sure Seb is entirely out of money. Three hungry, dumb kids in a store with not much money and a taste for the wild beckons a familiar feeling. Sneaking a rice ball in my bag here and a pastry in my sleeve over there. Sebastian takes a bag of chips and Kayla buys a set meal to avoid suspicion. It was just too easy. This time, I really feel high. It's like someone set up a bomb and we were the explosion. We know stealing is dishonored and cowardly. One of the lessons we learned in Thailand, a lesson from the Buddhist Eightfold Path, even states to never take what is not given. I've stolen small things like makeup and candy in America before. But something about the rush of stealing in a foreign country was way more infectious. Each time feels like a test on how far we can push it. If we could do it without getting caught, then why not do it? Soon, we started hitting the retail stores. With sweaty palms, I tucked a coin purse in my pocket. Kayla slyly takes a beanie and wears it as if she walked in with it. Sebastian nonchalantly waltzes out the store with a whole crew neck sweater. <laughs> Not once does anyone see us. It was wild how seamless it, how seamless it is, or so it seemed. Three days of tomfoolery passed, and it was our last night at Mommy's house. She asked us to pick up some eggs while we were out and about because she wanted to make us a farewell dinner. Mommy's loft was really close to a shopping plaza that had a bundle of stores varying from small bakeries and markets to the Japanese equivalent of Walmart, Seiyu. This Seiyu was a place we'd bought from before, but never had stolen. It was clearly more difficult to steal from a supermarket with cameras on every corner, so I told them to play it safe. Honestly, going in the building gave me big cop vibes, and I don't like cops. The mere presence of a cop makes me feel like I did something wrong, and my guilt from all the stealing was kind of getting to me. I should have listened to my gut. It's about noon when we walk in to get the things for a farewell party. Kayla grabs a shopping basket, and I put a plastic bag with bread from a bakery inside. Seb leads the way as we gravitate towards the grocery section. Eggs? Check. Juice? Check. Anything else? Kayla asks. Let's look around. We part ways in search of what other goods we can find for the coming night. In the midst of reading a bunch of packaging I can't really decipher, I see something odd. From a distance, two middle-aged men, both of them in casual clothing, are obviously staring at Kayla and Seb, who are across an aisle away from me. They start talking to each other, but then walk away, so I paid no mind. With all of us currently rocking completely shaved heads, I was used to people staring. With way more than enough snacks for the night, we keep on walking through the aisles until we reach the self-checkout. I'm thinking about snacking something, but this is my last night in Tokyo. I want to start a new leaf and not be a thief. It's so nice to get things for free, especially when it feeds me, but it feels like I'm paying with something else. Every item we take makes me feel like a cheater, as if I'm playing a video game with cheat codes, but the game slowly gets less and less enjoyable. Since we're backed up and ready to rumble, we practically skip to the exit doors, ready to party hardy. I swing open the glass doors with Seb and Kayla close behind me, but as I look back, I see somebody else right behind us, the two middle-aged men. They come fast, intensely fast. With no hesitation, one of them jams their hand into the plastic bakery bag I had walked in with and pulls out what looks like a packaged red bean-filled pancake. Immediately, they start speaking in Japanese with harsh and accusing tones. I can assume what they're saying, but none of it registers because I'm still dumbfounded at the pancake. My mind is racing with questions as I hear the men get louder and louder. I shoot my eyes to Kayla, and she looks just as shocked as I am. I trail my eyes towards Seth. The look on his face says it all. We don't know what they're saying, so the men swiftly grab Seth and I by the arms and drag us back into the glass doors. It felt like a blur. They lead all of us up the escalator to daunting double gray doors, an employee meeting room. Kayla was left outside of the room to wait. 
but Seb and I were directed to sit in front of a long brown table. The two men stood on opposite sides of the table, holding the pancake up, asking with their booming, enraged voices and broken English, Why? Thief? Who? I was so terrified, my skin felt ice cold. My vision blurred with tears as they got more and more frustrated. I knew Seb was more scared than I was. I could see his hands trembling underneath the table. In a plea, maybe to save me, Seb confesses to taking the pancake and tries to explain to them I didn't know. The men try their best to get the story from us, but the language barrier is too tall. They keep calling back up. My anxiety grows exponentially with each cop that enters the doors. By the second hour, there were a total of seven cops in the room. Eventually, they decide that they aren't getting very far with us. They slap handcuffs on both of us and individually ferry us away to the police station. Fuck. This is the first time I've ever been handcuffed. In the movies, they make it seem like it's really easy to break out of. So I keep imagining myself with super strength pulling the chains apart. But maybe it's just to make myself feel stronger. I can't believe Seb took that pancake. Like he couldn't pay 98 cents for a fucking pancake. My rage feels like I'm standing in a sauna. But at the same time, my stomach feels full of icy lead. Walking through the station, the walls are white like a lifeless hospital. All I can think about is Thailand. How the monks told us it's worth living an honest life and how all of that just went straight over our dumb, bald heads. <laughs> Suddenly, they start leading us to two different rooms. My heart starts to shake. I'm afraid if I lose sight of him, I won't see him again. My eyes are glued to his figure until they walk him into the room. Then the door shuts. For six whole hours, a translator helps me talk to a detective who wants to know my side of the story. By the end of it, I feel numb. My adrenaline from the events have dimmed, and all I want to know is where everyone is. But after what seems like an eternity, the detective tells me that I'm free to go, but Sebastian is going to be detained and put into jail. My heart crumbles. Of course this was going to happen. Karma, bite ba karma bites back when you need it and don't want it the most. I begged the detective to give me more information on how long and where is he going to be held. But the fact that I was not a family member means by law, I'm not owed any explanation. As they lead me out of the room, my eyes lock on Seb, sitting in a lone chair, still cuffed. I shine an affirming smile, hoping that it'll show him it will be okay, even though my fear tells me otherwise. A police officer drives me to mommy's house and leads me on the front steps like an abandoned kitten. I'm not really sure what to say once I knock on the door. Hi, mommy. Sorry we're eight hours late. Seb got arrested, and I don't know where Kayla is. Also, we didn't get the eggs. <laughs> Yikes. With all my courage, I knock on the door, and it rips open. I see mommy's gentle and relieved face covered in a clay mask, and right behind her, I see Kayla, also wearing a clay mask. They rush me with a fat hug and yank me inside. I shower change, put on an anti-stress clay mask, and we exchange our accounts of what went down. It turns out the police drove Kayla straight home from Seiyu. I share with them what happened to Seb, and I feel the news hang over us like a curtain. We don't know where he is. We don't know how long he could be gone. We call the U.S. Embassy, but they can't help us until he's had a trial, apparently. So we wait. A few days of uncertainty passes by. Leaving Tokyo without Seb isn't an option. We'd only been in Japan for less than two weeks, and I felt like I've been here for two years. This was supposed to be a good trip, and we ruined it by being dumb. All the things we'd stolen felt worthless if it meant my friend was in jail. All the food and stuff we took just simply wasn't worth it. A week from the arrest, Kayla's phone pings. A text from Seb glows on the, fr on the screen with the words, I'm free! Bless the gods he's safe. Kayla and I hastily meet up with him at the park. Is that's between mommy's house and the police station. Tears of relief rain from our cheeks as he tells us his experience once we parted ways and what it was like in the Japanese jail. Bruh, that shit was Bobo. <laughs> he sighs. And then we all laugh. I flash back to the monastery in Thailand. 
The sound of the morning bell rang through the temple grounds. 4 a.m., the only time of the day where the constant hum of cicadas fell silent. The thick, humid air reminding of the fact that there's more to space than just emptiness. The morning chants of the monks awakened something inside that you didn't know was sleeping. Like the morning bell, the words of the monk Buddhadasa rang in my head. You cannot truly claim to have understood something until you have experienced it. Okay. My family and I lived under the constant fear of our parents being deported. We were never allowed to talk about where our parents are from, that they are not allowed to leave this country. We even feared to speak in Spanish in public or leaving home because of, of the planned ice raids where we spend most time sh shopping or fishing at the Ocean Beach Pier. I remember one time my dad accidentally ran a stop in front of elementary school. Then the school cop arrested him and told me to go to class to get on with my day. But it was impossible when the words chicken and illegal alien that came out the cop's mouth kept on repeating in my head. Not until I came home and my mother, my mother told me that my father had gotten away with a ticket, I felt relieved. For a second, I thought I had lost my father. I wasn't able to imagine what life would be like without my parents, especially my father. I am his chicle, his pegoste, his alguate en el fundio. Since I was a child, my mother and him would, her, him would argue and I defended him no matter what the situation was by kicking at her, screaming at her, no le grites a mi papi. I am without a doubt a daddy's girl. I'm, I remember my first time driving to La Jolla. My parents took me out of school to sign me up at Muirlands Middle School. The drive was amazing. Never in my life had I seen such a beautiful neighborhood. I am from Encanto, the southeast of San Diego. For others, it is the hood or the ghetto, but to me, it is home. My classmates used to gossip about a girl they discovered that lived in some trailer parks, and they laughed at her, calling her names like Ratchet and Ghetto. No matter what our situation was, to them, we were poor. It made me very self-conscious. However, to my parents, our home was a blessing. A mobile home is the best that they could afford. Moving schools from one of the poorest communities of San Diego to the, one of the richest was a dramatic change for me and lying was my way of adapting. I introduced myself to other students in my math, sixth grade math class and trying to fit in. I said that my favorite sport was surfing and I've never even surfed in my life. <laughs> that same year, I was caught cheating in my English class on a reading assignment, even though I cheated on most of the reading assignments. <laughs> that was because as a child, my parents never had the time to emphasize the importance of reading. They worked long hours, so they never, had, they never read to me at night before bed like the parents at La Jolla did to their children. My dad could not read English well because he stopped going to school in Mexico after second grade. Another reason why I failed assignments was because the teacher told, told, would make us look for the aha moments in our independent reading books. But the whole time, I thought it meant laughing. So I would find random books and look for the funny parts. <laughs> this loss of interest in academics was accumulated all the way into high school. And I cared more about socializing with my friends. But eventually, the tables turned. In high school, I met teachers who guided me to find my interest in education, and it became my own passion. I started feeling like the smartest one in class. I felt confident, and I enjoyed doing our assignments. For example, reading diverse literature such as poetry, romance, even genocide and religion intrigued me. I voluntarily started reading, and my English teacher, Ms. Lacrand, assigned us Siddhartha. That book made me more conscious of the idea that life is a river with low and high frequencies. 
This made a big impact on my perception of life. Taking that class made me realize English wasn't so bad after all. And I challenged myself with bigger books and electing a harder class for 11th grade. In 12th grade, I moved back to Lincoln, five minutes away from home. The bus ride from La Jolla and back to La Jolla took several hours of each day. Academically, everything was easier for me in my local school, even though I took accelerated classes. Socially, my classmates were defensive. I understood the state of mind because of how we were and raised and our living situations. In English class, not many people liked me because I would raise my hand too much, and they grew spiteful of me. Because I went to a school in wealthy La Jolla, my Lincoln classmates thought I became whitewashed. Really? I lived the same as they did. I soon learned not to hide who I am, and I ignored the immature comments in that class. Going through these experiences are occurrences that happen to children that are victims of the system. They have no control of where they are born because their parents' home country is corrupt. Even worse, that our country, the United States, is the reason why the third world countries, as they say, are dependent on them. There are many children out there that have been separated from their families, and it still continues to this day. I became a victim of politics and desire of power. Donald Trump had ordered the judges to renew deportation warrants, and my father's was from 1998. My dad didn't deserve to be forced back to his country. He was going to work to help construction buildings, construct the buildings that we, we all use every day. At a low pay, he was exploited. People in power have the ability to kick somebody out who will settle their entire life in one country to separate families just for votes. I became aware of how the system works. On October 3rd, 2020, my father woke up extra early to cook himself and his coworkers lunch before he left to work. In order for my parents to get to my room, they would have to, in order to, for my parents to get to their room, they would have to pass through my room. They would, it would take me because they wouldn't make too much noise. And that morning, I didn't handle it, and I yelled at him, shh, haces mucho ruido, y no me dejas dormir. He told me, no más es rápido, ya me voy, y no me, no me hables así, porque soy tu papá. Dime sorry, he demanded. Sorry, I replied with the fuchi face. <laughs> then my dad left and came back one more time to let me know he was leaving already. He, he said that he left us burritos for breakfast and that he loved us. And my petty ass, pretending to be asleep and ignored him, and he left, this time for good. It was only 10 minutes later that I heard my sister Natalie's phone ring. Who could be calling her this early, I wondered to myself. Next thing I know, she blasted through my room, into my parents' room, shouted something. I cannot make sense of her words. What's wrong? What is it? My mom asked Natalie, barely being able to, talk, to tell us. My dad, they took him. Who took him? I took him. When those words came out of my sister's mouth, my heart dropped. I felt myself shrinking and the room getting bigger. It felt like a dream and I didn't want to wake up. At that moment, I was stagnant, stuck in the lowest point of the river. My father was deported and my mom soon voluntarily left to be with him. I am currently living in Mexico because living with my sisters didn't work out but I still get to work and go to school in the United States. I found greater value in my citizenship as an American, and I can't thank my parents enough for birthing me there because I have so many opportunities to do what I love, which is to help others. I wish I was never embarrassed of my own home, but now I see that it was actually a blessing and many people would love to live in it. And reading Siddhartha shaped the way I think today because now I get to see the reality of life. As Siddhartha says, life is like a river. And I was able to connect that to myself, to that moral truth. 
The river of life has a never the river of life has a never ending frequency that goes up and down and we're living in it. It is up to us to turn it into a good or a bad thing. We can let our problems consume us and it does happen sometimes. We do go down, but we can also decide to embrace our emotions and become resilient. Being a student among both flows of the cultures, American and Mexican, helps me become stronger. And I am navigating both rivers. Thank you. Nobody knew about the surprise except for my accomplice and best friend, Flora. Before leaving San Diego about three weeks before coronavirus, we came up with a surprise for my mom that left her speechless. A snotty nose, running mascara, hiccups. She was gasping for air and crying. The works. <laughs> I know Flora would vouch that her soul left its physical counterpart the second she saw me. It had been two years since I left the island of Guam. Depression was the boogeyman in my closet. As a foreigner to California back in 2018, he kept me company through the lunar hours. When I think of my initial move here, vivid memories of bloodshot eyes and pools of tears that I made, crying all night, longing for my family, it constricts my heart. Grappling with the pain of familial loneliness plagued my emotions, and for a while, I felt trapped. Nothing seemed to satisfy this blackened void craving more and more. Not work, not school, not friends. What I really wanted was to just be home. The beach, God, how I missed it. The ocean is actually warm and you can feel the turquoise blue colors reverberating the soul. And honestly, I hate the beaches here. They only serve as a reminder of what I once lost. Another thing that broke me was not having any friends. It was really rough. Besides separating from my boyfriend, my, uh, Flora was my second hardest goodbye. She and I spent every single day together. In the mornings, she would pick me up and then drop me back home after school. We would have boba shake dates at tea district on the weekends and if i were not at her house if i were not at home i was sleeping at her house to this day i'm still here in san diego and through the past years i've learned to call this place home am i doing better yeah am i enjoying my life out here now definitely nonetheless i changed i survived the strife and then bloomed anew but without a doubt I was homesick and ready to graft this new bloom with my founding roots. After a seven hour trip from Hawaii, I arrived on Guam on March 9th, 2020. The plane had touched down, but the idea that I was home had not hit. It was nearly 10 p.m. and the airport was silent, like someone was hosting a funeral in secret. On my way to baggage claim, I looked around and asked myself, where the hell did this part of the airport come from? <laughs> Who would have thought that a place that cannot fix potholes could afford to renovate its one and only airport? I picked my jaw from the floor, collected my luggage, and waited outside to meet Flora. As Chamorro's indigenous people of Guam, our culture thrives off the bonds created with family. The island is about 30 miles long from north tip to south, so it makes sense that families valued the most. There is literally no escape. <laughs> One of the deepest connections I have is with Flora. The movie Frozen is an all-time favorite of ours, and how Anna said to Hans from the movie, I've never met someone who thinks so much like me. <laughs> there wasn't a time when her and I got into mischievous predicaments together. She is the hammer to my nail. This is a favorite memory of ours. Flora and her mom, my mom and I, are standing in their kitchen. Our parents are having a conversation no more than a foot away from us. Flora is holding a soda can, and I try and swat her arm. As I go for the suing, I completely miss, sending the Coke can straight to the ground. The room goes silent. It took us a moment to realize what had happened as we stared at the puddle laughing. 
Ooh, these two, her mom says. And before we knew it, our parents thwacked us on the back of the head. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> One would assume that a reunion after two years would be magical. I know I thought it would. Nevertheless, what was it that made our long-awaited embrace feel so strange? I recall how anxious I was to jump on Flora as I sat in the plane. However, when she put up to the arrival zone, there were no tears and no butterflies. Apparently, as a cancer, I'm supposed to be an emotional train wreck, but I felt nothing. All I could feel was a heat permeating from her body as we hugged, but my heart and mind only perceived the icy layer that froze over our friendship. During the ride to my mom's house, awkward silence and countless ums filled the blank spaces between us. For heaven's sake, two whole years had passed and we had nothing to share? Bull freaking crap. <laughs> I crossed the physical ocean to see her again. I did not know there was still another that separated us. The foot of space between the driver and passenger seat felt like we stood on opposite sides of the world. I stared at the stranger who used to be my friend, trying to record every possibility that indicates change. Why does this feel so awkward? As my cranium pondered the answers to all my doubts, I grew angry with myself. My inner saboteur was shouting, pounding against the walls in my head saying, this is not what I wanted. It wasn't supposed to go like this. About seven hours ago, we were just saying how much we missed each other. So why now, after all this time, did this reunion feel so wrong? On our way to the apartment, I had Flora call my mom. Hey, Auntie Barb, sorry it's late. I just got off work. So Tadashi sent out a package and wanted me to drop it off to you. Can I swing by, she asked. Mind you, the phone call was on speaker and I was sitting in the passenger seat snickering like a five-year-old after hearing boob. <laughs> After what seemed like an eternity of driving, there it was, my old house on my old street. The funny thing is, driving down that road, I felt like I never left. Nearly everything was the exact same. My uncle's house across the street still had that annoying dog that barked at everything, including rocks. <laughs> Ugh, don't even get me started on the turd-colored brown apartment building with the diarrhea trim. <laughs> The color is horrific. Then suddenly, there it was, my old crusty home. Flora's red Toyota Corolla, Corolla pulled up to my mother's apartment building and clunked the gears to park. Immediately, the icy atmosphere vanished and nostalgic memories of our high school adventures flushed away the worries of forgetting my best friend. We turned to each other at the same time. As I gazed at this beautiful woman, my insecurities were blasted away, and I felt safe again. Our faces have this, oh my freaking god, this is happening look, and we shared a laugh. It was like the time the coke can hit the ground. Just like how Katie Heron pushed Regina George in front of a bus, it hit me. <laughs> Flora had changed no more than I did. Every day we spent apart, we grew independently as young adults and discovered our individuality. This was the origin of our disconnect. Losing the connection that made us two peas in a pod hadn't disappeared. We merely forgot what made us, us. Our self-diagnosis called for a prescription of TLC and healing. The truth hurts and bearing the sting can be a strenuous process, but through the strife and the fruits of our labor, we may bloom again. After two years, it was about to happen. This was the big moment. Containing the excitement to see my mom was hard, but this was a stealthy operation. I did a barrel roll like a ninja to the concrete wall below the front window. My mom answers, where's the package, Nen? I could not control myself. This is my mother standing right in front of me. I leave no room for explanation and jump the gun. Surprise, mama, I'm home. A week later, a bright day turned dark after a phone call with my mom. At the time, I was staying with my sister and my mother had called to remind me to remain safe due to COVID. Mom, it's not like it's a zombie apocalypse or something. I responded. It had set her off and she hung up. Not a second after, I was alerted by two Facebook notifications. 
It was her and she was furious, saying, You think I'm okay with the way you have talked to me? No. Watch your tone and your sarcasm when you talk to me. Stay with Hillary for the rest of your stay if you want to continue to be like that. I have done nothing to deserve your attitude. As if she were a switch, she flipped. Admittedly, my choice of words was negligent. However, to my concern, I was worried with where this intense fit of rage came from. There were no arguments while I was in San Diego, and the homecoming surprise was great. So where did this come from? I did not speak to her for the remainder of the day, and that evening, I asked my mom if I could pick up the star apples I had purchased a day ago. During the drive to her place, my stomach nodded as I remembered her words. With a deep breath, I parked the car and walked to the front door. As I opened the screen door, I found my fruits wedged, be wedged between the entryway and the main door. That is odd, I think to myself. Clearly something is wrong. Hello? Is everything okay? Why is my stuff outside, I ask? With one swift motion, the door swings open. There is my mother with a furrowed brow and the glare of a lioness. She points her finger square in my face and shouts at the top of her lungs. You know, if you want to talk to me like that, you can get the fuck out. <laughs> what the hell's going on? <laughs> like, As I bite my tongue, walking through the door, her triad continues as she says, Pack up all your shit and leave. In an instant, the place I once called home was no more. As I continue to gather my belongings, she's turned into a broken record, her ranting becoming worse. Parents may say the darnest things, but the one thing that never should have came out of her mouth scarred me for life. You know when you left, I should have just killed myself. What a way to speak to your kid, right? Thank you so much for making me feel like the biggest mistake that ever existed. After the initial shock, I saw my mom again. Not as a young man, but as the kid who remembers his mother's explosive habits. Certainly, she's still my mom, but with all her kids grown up, she could finally just be Barbara. My assumption was that our mother and son dynamic had changed. She became so bright, and at times when we would talk on the phone, I felt like she was seeing me as a friend. But with her loving and encouraging words, I realized all the pleasantry and all the adult conversations over the phone were merely sweet fantasies and sweet nothings. I forgot the toxic traits that make her my mom, and in that moment, she was nothing more than a volcano spewing lava and misery. Before my mom had blasted me for the entire village to hear, I thought she had changed. After digesting her outburst, I awoke to the reality that my mom remained the same. It's funny the things you remember about certain points in your life. I got to sleep in on this particular day because my dad was taking me to school. I woke up to the harmonious singing of the birds in the giant oak tree just to the left of my bedroom window. The sun shone bright and crept through the tiny breaks where my blinds overlapped. I got out of bed, got dressed, had my habitual bowl of Cheerios and banana paired with a red and purple Flintstones vitamin, then exited to the garage where I bickered with my little brother over who was going to get the privilege of the front seat. Devin Noel and Andrew Edward, knock it off before I knock it off for you. Both of you can sit in the back. Devin, you're the oldest. Your brother looks up to you. I expect you to be a better example for him. I always hated that. He always got away with more because he was younger. It wasn't fair. I was on my way to the third grade at Scott Elementary in Belton, Missouri. The road that led us from home toward the freeway was desolate, wrapping around woods crowded with trees that bowed over the street, shielding it from what little bit of sunlight shone through the clouds. The ground was still wet from the night prior, emitting a distinct odor of dirty concrete. That was one of my favorite parts of the thunderstorms that roared through the Midwest in the spring. Looking out the windows, seeing nothing but uncultivated land paired with the sweet, dewy petrichor always brought me such tranquility. Back at One by Brian McKnight played as we began our drive. As we made the turn toward the freeway, I sang along passionately. 
one you're like a dream come true two just want to be with you as we grew, grew closer to school the trees lessened and the fields grew the smell of cows and manure filled the air my brother and i watched out the window and shouted cows every time we saw a group larger than 10. we saw cows every day of our life but still found such glee in seeing them <laughs> the road leading to school was surrounded by open fields as far as the eye could see it was the same nothing we saw every day, so we paid very little attention to the plateau passing by and more attention to our squabble in the back seat over who was touching whom. There was something different about this day, though. My dad was different. We were about five minutes down the road from school, and my dad was sitting perfectly upright in his seat with both hands gripping the steering wheel. The music was gone. The car came to a stop. Why were we stopping? We weren't at school yet. Uh-oh, are we about to get in trouble? My dad looked at my brother and me in the rearview mirror but said nothing. There was something different about his eyes. Fear. I looked out the driver's side window from the back seat and watched as a police officer approached our car. A white officer. Why did he have his hand on his gun? It's okay. He's a policeman. He's here to help us. My dad rolled his window down. His body movements were slow and methodical, and he refrained from making eye contact. You know why I pulled you over, boy? No, sir. I do not. I didn't think I was speeding. Mm-hmm. Notice there's no plate on the front of your vehicle. License and registration. My dad slowly reached for the requested documents and provided them. He remained still and quiet, his hands on the steering wheel as the officer retreated to his car. My dad didn't say anything to us, and we in turn did not say anything to him. My brother and I looked at each other, both so confused but able to sense that we needed to remain silent. When the officer returned, he seemed to be more irritated than he was before. The way he was talking to my dad sounded just like Cinderella's stepmother talking to her. It was as if he was disgusted at the mere fact my dad existed. You think you're a real fancy nigger in this Mercedes, don't you, boy? Where'd you get it? That was the first time I had ever heard that word. Even though I had no idea what it meant, I could feel the ugliness radiate from the way he said it. In my confusion in trying to rationalize what was happening, I momentarily escaped into my own little world. I started replaying pieces of disagreements I had overheard between my parents about police. I remember hearing my mom say things to my dad like, you would have have to have done something. Things like that don't just happen. And you're starting to sound like your dad. I wish I would have listened more. Maybe then I'd understand. When I snapped back to reality, I heard my dad say something to the officer that to this day, 22 years later, still breaks me. Please don't shoot me in front of my children. This big, strong man I had, idolized, I had grown to idolize so much had accepted an unjustified fate as long as his children didn't have to witness it. My heart felt like an old tattered Ziploc full of rocks from the playground I loved playing on so much. There was a lump in my throat the size of my fist, slowly creeping its way up, becoming what felt like vomit. Why did my dad ask not to be shot? Was he really going to shoot my dad? He's a policeman. It was at that point the officer realized there were other people in the car. He looked through the window of the back seat at my brother and me, completely disgusted. My six-year-old brother stared back like a deer in the headlights while I looked at my dad, terrified. He barked orders at my dad in hushed tones, then retreated back to his car. We began driving again, and I was so happy we were finally leaving. I didn't like that man. We missed the turn to school, and I looked through the windshield in an attempt to see where we were going. The police car was in front of us. We were following him. Why were we following him? He was so mean. It was only a seven-minute car ride, but those seven minutes felt like a lifetime. I had no idea what had just happened, but I knew the events I had witnessed were far more complex than I was able to understand. I wanted to ask where we were going, why the policeman was so mean, if we were going to go to school today, but I didn't. I knew I needed to remain quiet. I just wanted my dad to hug me, tell me everything was okay, and take me home. We followed the officer all the way to the police station. 
When my dad parked, there was another officer waiting. My dad left with him, and a second officer took my brother and me into the police station. I began to cry watching my dad walk away, because even though I didn't know what was going on, I had this gut-wrenching feeling I may never see him again. As we were guided into the police station, I tightly gripped my brother's hand out of fear they might separate us. I didn't want to be there. I just wanted my dad back. The officer who brought us inside to the police station took us to a woman and left us with her. I think she was the station's social service representative, or maybe she was simply a secretary. I don't really know. She desperately tried to comfort me because at this point I was hyperventilating. She took us into a room that was obviously made for children, probably for children involved in accidents or taken away from abusive situations, or children like us, children whose parents had been taken to jail. The room was full of toys and stuffed animals, books and games, and had walls painted in bright colors and fun designs. In any normal situation, it would have been a kid's dream room, but for me, it was a nightmare. She gave me a stuffed bear to hold in an attempt to try to calm me. I'm sure she really thought this would help, but I wanted nothing to do with it. I didn't want anything from any of those people. I sat with my little brother who joyously pushed a toy truck in a circle around him. I so envied the innocence he was able to preserve. Dad said I had to be an example for Andrew. I have to protect him. I sat in a chair at a table by myself, staring, thinking, trying to understand what I had just witnessed. Why did a man that had sworn to protect us, a man that didn't even know us, hate us so much? Why did he hate my dad? Why did he call my dad names? What did that word mean? What had my dad done that was so bad? He wasn't a bad person. Where did they take him? We waited there for what seemed like hours for my mom. I was so happy to see her when she finally arrived, but still didn't feel the relief I so desperately wanted. We left without my dad. In the car, my mom asked us if we wanted to talk about what had just happened, and I told her no. Aside from simply not being ready, I thought back to those conversations I had overheard and worried she just might not understand. I didn't see my dad again until I got home from school that evening. I didn't want to bring up what happened out of genuine concern for upsetting him, but my dad, being the amazingly strong man he is, sat us down to talk about it after we got home. He took us into his office and sat us down in my big favorite yellow upholstered chair. He took a moment to just look at us, then wrapped us up in the warmest, most loving, comforting hug I had longed for all day. I want to start by letting you both know that I'm okay. Are you okay? I couldn't respond. I was just so happy to be with him. There are some things I need to teach you about the police. Things that shouldn't be, but are. He had the conversation that all African American parents have with their children in regard to the police. He taught us to keep our hands in plain sight and to avoid any sudden movement. We learned not to talk back or argue and to remain respectful, regardless of how we were being spoken to or how scared we might be. It was in that moment I learned of the reality of living in the United States as a person of color. I'll never forget that pivotal moment with my dad. I was only eight, but had personally witnessed racial bias in the police force and lived through a man using racial slurs towards someone I loved deeply. It was on the worst day of my life I learned I wasn't like my friends at school, and that even though my differences were beautiful, there would be situations I was considered less than simply because of the color of my skin. My dad never did drive us to school after, again after that, and I didn't mind. I understood. I just cherished that I still had him with me. Hello, my name is Elena Caras, and I will be reading La Casa de las Rejas Rojas. I stopped by in Tecate to visit what was left of my Nana Eva's house. I had not visited the home I grew up in in 15 years. It had burned twice. The first time in 2017, the fire started in the last room down the hall that used to be my room. It was empty at the time it burned. 
and the clouded painted ceiling that my nana and mother had painted was still there. The clouds, however, had turned gray and black, as if the same cloud of the smoke from the fire turned the ceiling into a storm. That fire wasn't as bad as the second one in 2019, where the house was left in ruins. A news reporter from the Tecate Times had recorded a live stream of the house burning on video. My mother sent me the video and it devastated me to watch my memories fade into the black smoke. After that second fire, I never dared to return until now. My Nana's house was built in the early 1960s, so it was old. It was a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. Bad electrical wiring was a determined cause of the fire, according to the fire marshal. I always said that my Nana took the house with her to the afterlife because it burnt down a couple months after she passed away in the summer of 2019. The house mimicked an hacienda style with five red brick arches that displayed the porch. The oxidized red rejas had a gated door that led you to the arches. The middle arch had a cast iron sign that was corroding and it read Familia Peñalosa Hernández. The scent of the wet gravel and the tierra mojada reminded me of the days Nana would make hot chocolate inside while we played Loteria as a family at the kitchen table. I walked through the gates and I gazed into a puddle of water on the red tile on the outside porch. The square tiles had a white line that was evenly patterned diagonally, making it look like it had cantaritos blancos. I never understood how water made it to the center of the porch when it rained, if it had a rooftop. La Casa de las Rejas Rojas. That's the only way we gave directions to someone so they can locate the house. Arch red gates that were four inch bars at width and at least seven feet high. I remembered a moment as a child when I was five running outside because the train was coming. Ahí viene el tren! Ahí viene el tren! I would jump on the rejas and watch the train pass, pulling 10 to 15 boxcars. I loved living next to the railroad because the train would make the rejas shake. I stood in the spot I did two decades ago looking at my grandmother's bougainvillea tree. The beautiful magenta flowers had purple veins. I could feel soft red petals covered in ash as I rubbed them, little pollen falling into my fingertip, leaving them with a hint of honeysuckle. This tree that had lived for decades, it watched my mother and I grow, and it watched the house we grew up in burn. I traveled through time as I stood in this place. In the first brick arch, my grandmother hung a four-inch barrel iron wind chime that was held by a rusted three-inch nail for nearly four decades. My tuti purchased it for her in Tucson, Arizona in the 1980s. If you listen closely, you can hear the wind songs as it danced with it. Those songs were always different depending on the weather. My grandmother replaced the original wooden front door with the white steel door. She decided to paint the door yellow. You couldn't miss it even if it was pitch black outside and the foco from the patio se fundió. She was resourceful at times. The door had patterned glass in the center, but it was pointless if you wanted to see who arrived because it was very blurry. Next to my grandmother's yellow painted door were crumbling walls decorated with the cracks of age. You could see my Nana's eccentric taste in the layers of colors and the pieces of chipped off paint. Pistachio, salmon, beige, brown, red. The history that lived inside what once was my home. I had to come back one last time. I had forgotten who I was and where I came from for so long. It had been a while since I visited La Casa. I thought if I could see it one more time and feel my Nana's memory, I could feel the warmth I had lost from my Nana when she passed away. 
I ran and danced around on this patio en cumpleaños, quinceañeras, bodas, bautizos, baby showers, reuniones that my grandmother would host. Thanksgiving was my favorite holiday because you could smell the burning wood from my nana's estufita de leña. It was a cast iron small square estufita with four round burners for the fresh tortillas that Inas that she would make for us. Las tufitas stood on stacks of old phone books, bricks, small pieces of wood slabs to get it a little bit taller because the vent tube was cut too short by the guy at the ferreteria. Winter in Tecate was delightfully cold. It was my favorite season. My tios would take turns cutting leña with the rusted hacha outside. You can hear my nana singing to Agustin Lara's boleros de oro from outside. All the cowboys from the block would stand around holding a cold beer around a makeshift fire pit with their sombreros on, their big wool jean jackets and their mudded boots soaking up the warmth and the smoke scent of the burning wood. I would watch their shadows casted by the light of a fire and pretend I was a cowboy too. They were waiting for my nana to finish making her food. The scent of the cooking ham in the oven lathered in natural honey with bean and cherries would travel down the block, inviting all the strays to the front of the house. They would wait there sometimes until the next day because Nana would save the leftover bones for them. She would also save three plates for the homeless people walking through the next day collecting beer cans. My idea of helping my nana cook in the kitchen was letting me lick the spoon after she'd cook a pie or a cake batter she would mix. I would sit in front of the oven watching the cheesecake batter rise, my mouth watering. My nana's tamales were famous. She wouldn't let just anyone make them with her because she was a superstitious woman. And she believed that if you carry bad energy, you give it to the food. Hace que los tamales salgan amargos. Nana really took her time with her cooking. It was her craft. She would begin preparing every meal a day before the event. She worked so hard all morning, day, and night. Güera, Chiva, Eva, Nana. She answered to all of those. She stood at 5'4 last time I stood next to her trying to measure my own height. She used to be 5'5". Five five. <clears throat> she would tell me that the chemo chemotherapy shrunk her bones. When she was younger, she would tell people she was 5'7 because she would religiously wear heels. As an older woman, though, her uniform consisted of a checkered pattern purple Mexican apron that would go over her head and tie on the sides. The apron was well decorated with bleach spots, salsa stains, and cake batter. My nana had beautiful hazel eyes that could pierce through your bullshit. Her nose was thin and narrow, and her lips were symmetrical with the pivot at the top of her, her lip and the center making a puckered, heart-shaped little beak. She was too light-skinned and blonde for a Mexican woman. People thought she was a gringa. She was headstrong and stubborn and believed in tough love. A caring woman with all the humility at heart. Although she was very outspoken and had absolutely no filter, there was always comfort in her ringing voice. There was still some eggshell pieces buried with the dirt under the trees on the patio around the house. Nana loved her lemon trees. One dog in particular, Chiquita, who was a very dedicated mother and had at least a hundred litters in her lifetime was buried under one of those trees on the side of the house. Our backyard was a pet cemetery for two family generations. There were two six-foot T-shaped poles in the backyard that stood 10 feet apart, tied from one side to the other with the yellow mecate. It was my nana's tendedero. Our towels would smell like manzanilla and they were crispy and hard because they were air dried by the tecate wind. There was a 1991 white BMW 5 Series sitting in the same spot 
It's been for almost two decades. Tuti said he would fix it when my mother sold it to him, and he never did. So it became our backyard monument. All four flat tires, dust collecting, spiderweb haven that was shelter for strays and shade for snakes. As I walked through the property on my way out, I had realized that I had found what I was looking for in the ruins of my grandmother's burnt down house. Thank you. As I sat with my mom for the last time that day, I sat at the edge of her bed and watched her chest rise and fall with each breath, wondering which breath would be the last one, both hoping and dreading that that last breath would happen after I left. She would open her watery brown eyes every so often, her gaze muzzy and movement slow, raising her sparse eyebrows as if perpetually surprised by something. That is how it had been for the last few days. Sometimes she was upbeat and alert, other times distant and confused. My sisters and I had tried so hard to extract memories from her, starting so many sentences with, remember when? Remember when we picked so many blackberries that summer and had a berry fight covering everything in sticky purple juice? Remember when we drove up to Hurricane Ridge and us girls had a pretend fight in the back seat to distract you from the steep cliff on the edge of the road? Sometimes she would focus her milky gaze on us and she would be there with us in those moments. Other times she was remembering something else, something we couldn't see or hear or touch that was hers alone. But our compulsion to gather these random broken memories never lessened. We held each fragment she offered up to the light, searching for some answer or some truth to hold on to before reluctantly storing it in a pocket for another day when that small connection would be all that we would have left. That day dawned with a particularly gorgeous Pacific Northwest morning the kind of morning where you turn your face up to the fleeting warmth of the sun. I opened the curtains for her bedroom so that we could see the golden sunlight stream through the tall trees in the backyard, igniting the overgrown grass and a glowing patch of emerald green. Through the open window, we could hear the rumble of the lawnmower as the neighbor cut his lawn, the sweet scent of fresh cut grass with the acrid stink of gasoline, not an entirely unpleasant smell, was a keen reminder of a long ago days full of summer chores in the yard once dreaded, but now cherished memories of time together. All morning I'd kept looking at the clock, silently counting the hours, then the minutes, watching them slip away like garden soil between dirt-darkened fingers. Sitting by her, I kept thinking, how blessed was I that I had those last moments, an unexpected opportunity for goodbye, and I found myself at a loss. I couldn't think of a damn thing to say, and it scared me. I was afraid I was letting this moment escape, like the untethered canoe floating away silently. I want to go home, she whispered, looking at me with rummy eyes. You are home, Mama. I replied softly, taking her hand. Her skin was paper thin, and I could see her pulse throb gently in the gray-blue veins at her wrist. I lightly rubbed her knobby knuckles thick with arthritis and was reminded of those same hands teaching me to tie my shoes when I was four. I just want to go home she repeated. I had never heard her sound so forlorn, and I found myself searching her face for clues as to what she was really asking for, but couldn't find anything but a haunted expression and dull vacant eyes. Was she wanting to go back to our old house, the one she lived in when Pops passed? Or back out to Seabeck, where she grew up? Or maybe to the place where our people came from, the people of the inside and the people of the clear salt water, where we've always been, where our ancestors calling her home? She rambled on about people she wanted to see and mumbled about other things that made little sense, and I wished fiercely that I'd thought to ask more questions. There was still so much I didn't know. But I took a deep breath, and I let the sadness flow through me like a wave of cold water until I felt only a fleeting trickle. I rubbed her legs and was reminded of how I used to tease her about not wearing shorts in public because she was embarrassed to show her legs. What makes you think everybody is checking out your sexy legs anyway? <laughs> I'd ask her, and she'd laugh and laugh, and I'd brush her hair. It was hanging softly past her shoulders for the first time in more than 50 years, finally back to its natural brown with only the slightest smattering of gray at the temples. 
I showed her pictures of my girls, recounted stories of our adventures together, sang her some of the songs I could remember that would only remind me of her. Just remember in the winter, far beneath the bitter snow, lies the sea that with the sun's love in the spring becomes the rose. Some thought she could hang on to, but others were fleeting. And as the seconds ticked by, I reminded her frequently that I had to go soon. My living so far away from home had always been a challenge for us. Port Orchard was very far from San Diego. Though I was just one of her many children, I was always the one she leaned on, the one that took care of everything. So every so often she'd ask me if I could stay all day or if I could just wait and go home tomorrow. But why do you have to go? She lamented like a plaintive child. She asked me if she could get a plane ticket too. She asked me when I'd be back. She asked me who was going to put her to bed after I left. And I sat there trying to figure out what to say, how to answer her when I knew she was dying, but I didn't know if she knew she was. With each minute that passed, the empty space inside me began to fill with something. I felt like a can of soda that had been shaken one too many times. I felt the prickling pressure of the bubbles building in my chest, rising to the top of my head. The tears were hell-bent on finding ways out through the small cracks in the mask that I was trying so desperately to hold together for both of our sakes. I was running out of time. I thought frantically about what these final moments meant and what I wanted to say. I wanted to articulate something perfectly profound that I'm sure was described so eloquently in one of her Harlequin romance books that she used to read in bed with like a Tootsie Pop between her lips. <laughs> but what? I knew logically there was nothing that I could say in that moment that would be able to encompass everything I was feeling, nothing that would be able to heal any wounds or fulfill any promises or create new hopes and dreams, and it left me dumbfounded. I'd spent my whole life having words with my mom, saying them and hearing them, loving words, angry words, hopeful words, sad and happy words. As a child, the words were me begging for her attention, waking her in the middle of the night because I'd had a bad dream, asking her questions about any of the hordes of craft projects that she was putting together. Why is it we do every craft but weaving baskets? You know, lots of natives weave baskets. I could teach you. I joked, but she deftly crocheted the tiniest strands of threads into her own intricate pieces of art. As a teenager, the words were my shouting at her that I hated her telling her I was going to drive whether she liked it or not, and completely ignoring most of the words she said to me between the ages of 13 and 18. I understand my driving scares you, but you're going to have to get over it. I was six when my brother died. You cannot keep punishing me for that. Of course, I screamed before I walked out the door. And finally, as a grown woman, the words were my telling her I was pregnant for the first time and crying with her when I lost that baby and celebrating with her when my youngest daughter was finally born. And we would spend hours on the phone calling each other six or seven times a day, and I would cry to her when I was homesick, ask for help when I didn't know how to be a good mom yet, and I'd listen patiently as she taught me to make chicken and gravy over the phone, all from 1,200 miles away. Many times, if she hadn't heard from me in two hours, she would call me to ask me why I hadn't called her yet. And I told her I'm so, so sorry for everything I ever did as a teenager, <laughs> as my own children became teenagers and drove me crazy. So many words, a lifetime of them, and now the well was truly empty. I had the stunning realization that if she didn't know before that day how much I loved her, how much I was going to miss her, and how much she meant to me, nothing I said in that moment was going to fix it. We had formed a bond, she and I, and that was deeper than mother than daughter. I had learned to see her as her own person, and I was so blessed to know her as a strong, talented woman that she was. I knew her humor and her work ethic and her ability to create something out of nothing, which I inherited, thank goodness. She was flawed beyond belief, and she was so much more than cigarettes and dying. She said once that she didn't want flowers after she died someday, that if we couldn't be bothered to send them to her when she was alive, she sure as shit didn't want them when she wasn't. And now I think that last words are like funeral flowers. If we don't say them when they deserve to be said, but wait until the end... You can't do anything with them, but sadly watch them wilt and crumble into nothing. So that final moment with her taught me that. And in the grand scheme of things, last words don't mean shit. It's the first words and the middle words. 
<laughs> that mean everything. All of the I love yous, the nicknames, secrets, jokes, memories. It's even the fighting words if they're accompanied in time by forgiving words. It's the whispers and the laughs, the songs and the stories. And all of the words left unspoken because you already know what they are without saying them. So that last day as I sat by her bed for what was the last time, I realized I had no more words to say. Nothing profound or poetic or especially meaningful. I thought to myself, how lucky am I? I was blessed to have some final moments with my mom, an opportunity to say anything I needed to or wanted to, and I didn't need to say a single thing because it had already been said in a million words and a million ways over a lifetime. And so I made a vow right then that if I did nothing else in my life, I would leave nothing unsaid with my own daughters so that someday they too could understand the feeling that I had just discovered. So I whispered to her how much I loved her as I watched her doze. And I sat silently there with my cup of coffee, my hand on hers. Her eyes weren't even open when I left. There was no goodbye. I just kissed her swiftly, and I carried that lifetime of words in my heart as I walked out the door, and I never looked back. My hometown was small, even by rural standards. 1,400 people scattered amongst the back roads and wooded hills of western New Hampshire. Like most small towns in the region, we had our requisite post office and library. Our gas station sat on the edge of town while our plain white church took up too much space in the center. There wasn't anything particularly remarkable about the town itself. The scenery was pretty and its residents were kind, but mostly people just drove through it on their way to get someplace else. So long as you had some gas in your tank, there wasn't much of a reason to stop unless you knew one of the residents, which was rare. Most of the townsfolk didn't get out too much unless they had a damn good reason to. My family was relatively poor growing up, probably a lot poorer than I realized at the time. My parents are both honest and hardworking people. They just never seemed to get ahead for it. Even for a college-educated couple, all it took was one bad home loan and the added cost of a new child and began to financially drown. Eventually, my mom stopped working so she could raise my brother and I full-time and save money on daycare. My dad took on a second, then eventually a third job. We lived like that for years, paycheck to paycheck, always within our means. I don't know how they did it, but somehow, they made it work. Even with our financial troubles, my parents did all they could to give us a good life. One thing my father always made time for was the outdoors. It was the main reason my parents had started their family in such a remote area. He made sure we had a deep respect for the land, for the tools we used, and how our circumstances could always take a turn for the worse. He even established a Boy Scout troop for the town so he could pass on the lessons he'd learned for as many years as an outdoorsman. It was through these outings that I developed a deep love for the wilderness and honed my skills to explore it. I could have never predicted how much those skills would help me one day or how much trouble they might put me in. Like most kids getting ready to graduate high school, I found myself at a crossroads, unsure which path to choose. One thing that had become abundantly clear to me, though, was that my future wasn't paved with options. My test scores weren't bad, but with a meager $200 in my college fund, I knew there was I wasn't going to go to any university in the fall. I suppose I could have taken out loans like some of my friends did, but I couldn't stand the thought of saddling my parents or myself with $100,000 in debt without really knowing what I wanted to study. In the midst of the Great Recession, going to college in 2009 just felt like another bad investment. You could find a decent labor job in the area if you had the right skills and connections, but I had neither. I didn't have a family member with a construction company or a logging business nearby. I had no natural trade to fall into or a family business to inherit. It was liberating in a way to not live in the shadow of that kind of expectation, but liberation wasn't going to help me pay my bills. The financial crisis hadn't really improved by then, and there were plenty of skilled craftsmen looking for work. At the age of 18, with a $7 minimum wage, I knew that if I was lucky enough to find something that was more than a seasonal gig, I still wouldn't earn enough to live. I considered the military for a moment. It was a good option for kids in my tax bracket. However, it didn't take much reflection for me to figure out that I had no interest in joining the war. All that death over sand and oil, it didn't make sense to me. It just felt like a waste. Furthermore, we had people from our school go off to the desert. They didn't all make it back. The year started moving faster and it felt like I was running out of options and time. No lofty college dreams, no trade prospects, no shiny uniforms. I thought about just staying home for a year. I could live with my folks, work at the restaurant downtown, and see if inspiration would strike. What really started to scare me was the realization that if I did that, nothing was going to change. I started to develop this deep fear that if I didn't do something radically different with my life, then nothing new would ever happen to me. I wasn't sure what it would look like yet, I just knew there had to be some other option for me. As I searched for answers, a bold new idea entered my life in the form of a major motion picture. 
Into the Wild and the Adventures of Christopher McCandless would go on to drastically alter the course of my life. This guy McCandless, he had all the opportunity and privilege a person could ask for, yet he threw it all away to spend his time discovering himself. He lived off of basically nothing. He did it all on his own terms. It was such a simple answer, but it resonated with what I needed at the time. I figured if we're good enough for him, then maybe it could work for me too. I could stealth camp just about anywhere, and hitchhiking didn't cost a thing. It wasn't much of a plan, but it was better than sitting still in a town with one traffic light. I made my preparations slowly that spring. I spent my salary on new hiking gear that I stashed away in the trunk of my car. I read whatever traveling tips I could find online on our family's ancient hand-me-down desktop. I even went as far as to set up a secret P.O. box so I could get a passport just in case I got close to a border. No one knew what I was about to attempt. I didn't tell a soul. Deep down, I knew if anyone found out what I was thinking, I'd probably be talked out of it. People didn't just leave. Maybe some people in some places, but not here and not us. I told myself that it had to be this way, to give myself the space to make it real. The truth is that it never has to be a certain way. All these years later, though, I I still tell myself that it did. The cover story I told my parents was that I was going to rehike a section of the Appalachian Trail I'd taken a few summers earlier and spend time contemplating my future. The real plan was to park the car near a nearby campsite, hike up the north side of the first mountain, cross over the summit to a trail that intersected a state highway. I didn't have a set destination in mind. Considering my starting point was only a few hundred miles from both the Canadian border and the Atlantic Ocean, I just knew I'd be heading west. My first night out, I didn't even leave my car. It was pouring rain by the time I reached the trailhead. Even if I reached my hitching spot, I knew no one would pick me up. Too suspicious to drive home, I opted to stay the night at the campsite. I laid in the back of my sedan and read an old paperback copy of Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles until I fell asleep sideways against the door of my sleeping bag. I was restless, but undeterred. I woke the next morning in a sweat to the burning light of sunshine streaking through my window. After taking a final inventory of my gear and leaving a note for my parents, I locked my car for the final time and stashed the keys in my gas cap. I didn't own a cell phone at the time, but I planned on calling my parents from a payphone once I was out of state. I had an 80-liter backpack filled with survival gear more books than I could read, for some insane naive reason now lost to me, 10 pounds of jasmine rice. Along with my camping gear, my cook stove, and tent, I owned the clothes on my back, a couple hundred dollars in dishwashing money, and a small wooden mandolin my father had given to me for my 18th birthday. I hit the trail by mid-morning and set off towards some ostensible great unknown. From the elevated trailhead, it was only two miles to the top, with about 1,700 feet of elevation gain. It's not generally considered a hard climb, but with over 60 pounds on my back, every step was a mental struggle my body was not ready to take. I stopped twice as often for twice as long. Most of my water was gone by the time I was halfway to the top. I was so focused on getting there that I barely even took in the scenery. I finally summited a few hours later to a scene of people hurriedly packing their bags. One man looked at me as he passed heading back down the trail in the opposite direction. Storm's coming in, he said. You should really get off the mountain. I turned back around to look at the sky. A wall of black clouds are rolling in from every northerly direction on the horizon. I knew that the situation was serious. Standing above the timberline, the summit was all exposed granite. My legs still ached from the climb, and my shoulders screamed from the unfamiliar burden of my backpack. It was a short distance back to cover, but as I already accepted the fact I was about to get drenched, I decided to take a quick break and rest. Thunder cracked several times a minute. I could see the lightning striking regularly in the distance. I could feel the wind picking up as I finished my energy bar. The first rain drop started to fall as I reached over my pack, so I started running back to the trees, careful of my footing on the newly slick rock face. The skies opened up only a few minutes after I made it back below the tree line. I closed it a little to repel the rain, quickly soaking me to the bone. I started to realize the true intensity of the storm, how far I still had to go to get off the trail. Taking all that into account, I decided the best action I could take would be to set my tent and try to weather the storm out in the forest. I found a patch of flat ground for the shelter between a few red spruce trees slightly off trail. Kneeling on the ground, I opened my backpack and pulled out my tent, ripping apart the tent poles as I frantically set to work assembling them. It was about halfway through when I looked up to see a rush of water pouring down the trail. All the rain that had collected on the summit was now spilling off down its slopes. The same trails that had brought me to safety had now become the path of least resistance for the water. The force wasn't strong enough to move me, but the water flooded into my backpack and soaked through all of my belongings. I had the foresight of wrapping a few delicate things in a trash bag before the hike, but most of my gear was not so lucky. I remember kneeling there, tent poles in hand, listening to the thunder roar as I reassessed my situation. I was cold, angry, and scared. This is stupid, I thought. I don't need to do this. 
I have a car at the bottom of this mountain. I can go home. Never tell anyone about this. No one will ever know. I don't need to do this. Something clicked inside of me at that moment. I can't explain exactly what it was. Just this intense feeling that if I didn't go through with this plan, that I would never know it would have happened and my life would somehow be worse for it. I didn't want to live a life of regret, not knowing where this chance might have taken me. I think I was mostly scared of disappointing myself. I knew it would be waiting for me if I turned around and back down the north side of that mountain. I'd seen enough people grow old back there and have very little to show for it. My family worked hard. They went to church, they were involved in the community, yet they still couldn't get ahead. Most good people I knew never did. For as long as I can remember, I felt there was a disconnect between what was being told to me and what I saw in the world around me. There was something wrong with this narrative of the American dream that I had been given, but I couldn't quite tell you what it was. I knew that I would never find the answers to my questions, though, if I just went home. Wherever my new motivation came from, I'll never know. But in that moment, I stopped being afraid. In a strange way, I think this was the last time where I really thought of myself as a child. I put away my wet tent, clutched my mandolin to my chest, and set off down the southern trail. It was a cold and muddy affair. The trail was more like a river than a road, and I spent more time trying to avoid it than walk on it. At one point, the puddles went up over my boots. The sky was alive with lightning, and in the beat of a cold shiver, I tried not to think about what the tallest conductor in the valley was. I sang songs to keep my mind active. I had conversations with myself. I yelled at the skies. Eventually, the ground leveled off, and I found myself walking down a gravel road away from the trail. I saw a house or two along the way and thought about knocking, but quickly decided it would not be for the best. I know this route had to connect to a route of some kind if I followed it long enough, almost certainly the route I was looking for. I finally made it to pavement a short while later and was overjoyed to see that I was only a few miles from a town. It was getting dark by the time I arrived, so I spent my second night and a large portion of my money on a cheap motel. When I was finally able to close the door to my room, I felt a flood of relief fill my chest. I took a long, hot shower and spent the better part of the night drying out clothes and assessing the damage to my gear. I crawled into the warm, cheap bed and immediately fell asleep. I didn't know what to expect in those early days. Lessons were learned fast on a sink or swim basis. That day on the mountain was the first of many tests to come. Looking back, I recognized the recklessness and the selfishness of my actions, but I couldn't tell you what I'd do differently. My life felt like it was getting boxed in before it even had the chance to begin. The best solution I could come up with at the time was to break through the siding. You can call it anything you want, but I don't think you can truly say that I ran away from home. If I'd left six months earlier, maybe I'd be a candidate for a milk carton somewhere, but as an adult, I just felt like I was starting something new someplace else. I didn't run from anything. I just left. The following day, I was picked up after only 20 minutes of hitching by a guy who was going back to his home in New York City. Not only did he give me a lift, he let me stay with him for a few nights and even helped me plan my next route. The hardest moment of that first trip came when I finally got the chance to call my parents and tell them where I really was and what I was planning to do for the next year. Ring, ring. Hello, my mom answered. Hi, mom. Well, that's our show. Thank you for spending time with us and remembering that stories do matter, especially in this time. We want to. Uh, <laughs> we want to especially thank our. We want to especially thank the performers, all the writing and performance coaches. So say we all, and the San Diego City College Social Justice and Education Conference. Good night. Bye.